Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start at the very least on my review of Poetry in Motion 2. Um, I credited this as being written by Alan Bennett. It's actually written by Alan Bennett, Jermaine Greer, John Mortimer, and A.S. Byatt. That in itself hints at one of the things that I didn't like about this one as much as the first Poetry in Motion, because that one was exclusively written by Bennett and focused on different poets. This one is written by four different authors, and each one kind of has a theme um, rather than a specific poet, which I didn't enjoy quite as much. But I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to try and read you the blurb. There is a sticker over the top of it, so it might be tricky. Um, then I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs and then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, Dane reads. Poetry in Motion 2 is an exploration of four of the multifarious themes that poets have sought to illuminate throughout the centuries. Employing a total of 45 poems as examples, Alan Bennett looks at adulthood, Jermaine Greer examines women poets in love, John Mortimer investigates vice and villainy, and A.S. Byatt in In Memoriam discovers the responses of a number of poets to the deaths of those they have loved and admired. The book is complete by an index, suggestions for further reading, and information on poetry in general. So, let's go through and check some out. So this is Childhood by Alan Bennett. And here he's writing about childhood in general. He says, I am possibly not the best person to talk about childhood, though I had one, of course. Looking back, I feel I was much more middle-aged then than I am now. I read biographies and autobiographies backwards, childhood being the last thing I want to know about somebody. And while I have some nostalgia for the world as it was when I was a child, I have none for the frightful little creep I was in it. Poems by children are hard to come by. One of the attributes of a poet is, after all, the capacity to become a child again, to see things as if for the first time, the world made fresh. So poems about one's early years are almost inevitably poems of recollection or reconstruction. They are not reports from the frontier. I just thought this was interesting too, the idea of memorising stuff, he says. What children are likely to know snatches of are the poems of Roger McGough or Brian Patton, just as their parents may only recall the lyrics of Bob Dylan. I do not mean that one thing is just as good as another if I say that I do not think it much matters what you have by heart as long as you have something. A page of wisdom, the dialogue from Casablanca, the parrot sketch or even a television jingle. They all tell you something about words and go to thicken the cerebral soup. Okay, fun fact, I know Pi. Pi is 3.14159265385897932386433832795028841. Feel free to pause and play that back, see if I got it right. Alright, on to Jermaine Greer. Um, there was a weird bit in her biography here. Um, so she taught English literature at Warwick University 1968-73 and the University of Tulsa 1980-83. She has lived in the United Kingdom since 1964. So she taught at the University of Tulsa while living in the United Kingdom. And this is before the internet. How did that work? Did she just have a really long commute? I don't understand that. So moving on here, this is on Vice and Villainy by John Mortimer. Um, and he just says here, this is a collection about, of poems about villains, the black hats, the bad guys. And I just thought that was interesting because that's one of my fun facts. So early, the, and you get this in like black hat SEO and white hat SEO. So black hat SEO is trying to trick search engines into ranking your website by doing like sketchy things like keyword stuffing and all of that. Um, and it gets its name because back in the day in westerns, the villains wore black hats and the good guys wore white hats. And it was because it was black and white TV. So that was how they used to sort of differentiate between the two for the viewer. And there's this interesting little bit here about the gender differences. So it goes, uh, although women seem to commit fewer crimes than men, many male criminals take the old fashioned view that a woman's place is in the home and not out robbing banks. Villainy knows no sex barriers. And this poem shows what great con artists women can be. It also has the most ingenious rhyming scheme. So I'm going to read this out to you. It's not too long. This is French Lisette, A Ballad of Maid Avail by William Plowman, 1903 to 1973. Who strolls so late for mugs of bait in the mists of Maid Avail, sauntering past a stucco gate, fallen but hardly frail? You can safely bet that it's French Lisette, the pearl of Portstown Square. On the game she has made her name, and rather more than her share. In a coat of coney with a passport phony, she left her native haunts for an English surname, exchanging her name and then took up with a ponce. Now a meaning look conceals the hook some innocent fish will swallow. Chirping, nullo, darling, like a cheeky starling, she'll turn and he will follow. For her eyes are blue and her eyelids too, and her smile's by no means cryptic. Her perm's as firm as if waved with glue, she plies an orange lipstick. An orange red is her perky head under a hat like a tiny pie. A pie on a tart, it may be said, is redundant, but oh, how spry. From the distant tundra to snuggle under her chin, a white fox was conveyed. And with winks and leerings and Woolworth's earrings, she's all set up for trade. Now who comes here replete with beer? A quinquagenarian clerk, who in search of life has left the wife and the kiddies in Tufnell Park. Dear sir, beware for sex is a snare and all is not true that allures. Good sir, come off it, she means to profit by this little weakness of yours. Too late for alarm, exotic charm, has caught in his gills like a gaff. 
He goes to his fate with a hypnotized gait, the slave of her silvery laugh, and follows her into a suite of sin, her self-contained bower of bliss. They enter her flat, she takes his hat, and he hastens to take a kiss. Ah, uh, if only he knew that concealed from view, behind a folk weave curtain, is her fancy man called Dublin Dan, his manner would be less certain. His bedroom eyes would express surprise, his attitude less languor. He would watch his money, not call her honey, and be seized with fear or anger. Of the old technique one need scarcely speak, but oh, in the quest for romance, tis folly abounding in a strange surrounding to be divorced from one's pants. Very nice. So here we learn about some bad guys that we get. It was said of Dr. Crippen that he was a kindly, modest and hospitable little man, endlessly, endlessly tolerant of his impossible wife. He behaved with great dignity at his trial, only concerned for the acquittal of his mistress, and he faced death with quiet courage. And yet he brought himself to kill his wife, dismember her body and bury it under the cellar floor. Herbert Rouse Armstrong was a gentle lawyer from the little town of Hayon Wye, who not only murdered his wife, but attempted to do in a rival solicitor. His manners were so good that, when he passed his intended victim a poisoned scone at tea time, he uttered the immortal words, Excuse fingers. Terrible moments of inhumanity are surrounded by the quiet and casual concerns of everyday life. So yeah, that's all I wanted to flag out and share with you from Poetry in Motion 2. The weird thing about this is, obviously there's poems, like 45 poems, and there's only that one that I read out to you. Um, the poems were fine, you know, but it was the actual, the kind of written essay surrounding the poems that I found the most interesting. Overall, I gave Poetry in Motion a 3.5 out of 5. It was alright. It would be a weak one, though. So there we have it. That's what I made of Poetry in Motion 2 by Alan Bennett, Jermaine Greer, John Mortimer, and A.S. Byer. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.